This is the Commission Church Online. Welcome to our podcast. We want to be a church who brings heaven on earth through the word of God and the love of Christ. I pray this week's message blesses you. We're in a sermon series in the, the book of Matthew, uh, and uh, we've, we took a few weeks off from the sermon series just to focus in on what God was speaking to us prophetically. How many of y'all were here last Sunday? Wasn't it amazing? It was powerful, amen? Uh, Just to be in the presence of God and Pastor Ravi brought a powerful word to us and uh, I just wanna say uh, thank you to him. I know he's not here, but uh, it was a very necessary word. And uh, that, was the, that was the reason why we paused, because we know that God sends people in his time to bring certain uh, messages that are very much needed for the season that we're going through in our church, or you as a family are going through, that Pastor Robbie probably had no idea about, but God knew that we needed. As a church, we needed that word. My God is a, a God of restitution, and we're in a new season where God is restoring us, and there's also restitution happening. There's also a, uh, there's, it's, it's just not a restoration of time or just not a restoration of what, what, is, what has been lost, but a, a true restitution of sorts that God is going to send to us. So thank, I, I thank God for that word. But what we're going to do is we're going to continue the sermon series for two more weeks, and then we're going to take another break so I can do an Advent series. And although it's not going to be a full-fledged Advent series, uh, as Advent begins this week, and for some of y'all that's, that have not been a part of Commission for the last four years, uh, or uh, have, have probably been uh, a part of a church that has not um, uh, talked about the Advent, or you don't know what the Advent really means, it's going to be really eye-opening because the Advent is the gospel of Jesus Christ. And uh, it's going to give me a, a few weeks, around three weeks, for me to share the Advent message with you guys. So I'm going to take a break till Christmas is over. And uh, we're going to continue with Matthew uh, after that. So uh, today I want to continue in Matthew chapter 5. Uh, you know, we read uh, a bunch of verses. Uh, I want to title my message, uh, Salty and Lit. Salty and and lit, okay? This is what I want us to uh, focus in on today. As Christians, as believers, we are called to be salty. Someone say salty. And we are called to be lit. Say lit. Say I'm salty. Say I'm lit. Uh, some of you are like, what does this mean? This is weird. Let's, let's go through this, okay? We, we went through verse number 1 through verse number uh, 12 already, but here's what we're going to do. We're going to read it because this is going to give us context for our study this morning. You ready? Here's what the Bible says. Seeing the crowds, Jesus went up the mountain and he sat down. His disciples came to him and he opened his mouth and he taught them saying, blessed are the poor in spirit for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when others revel you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Now here's where we're going to start our study this morning. So verse 13, you are the salt of the earth. You are salty, is what Jesus is saying. You're the salt of the earth. You are ought to be salty. For, but if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. Wow, pretty harsh. Verse number 14, it says, You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket but on a stand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Can we pray? Father, would you speak to us through the word? In Jesus' name, amen. Short prayer. That's how a Thanksgiving meal prayer should be. 
we shouldn't be praying for the kingdom of God to come and, you know, everyone's salivating. You, you know what I'm talking about. Y'all, y'all were at the Thanksgiving dinner table and you're like, just get over with the prayer already. Let's just get to the turkey or the ham. But Jesus is uh, talking to the disciples. Uh, verse number one is pretty landmark because we've spent a lot of time talking about it. Jesus has separated himself from the crowd of people that were thronging him, his fans, people that were just around to see what Jesus was all about. And he was like, man, I just need to make sure that I get this message across. This, what we're studying, is the most powerful sermon that was ever preached. The shortest sermon ever preached and the most powerful sermon ever preached. Not like Pastor Osher's sermons, all right? This was the shortest sermon all right, although it lasts a few chapters and we're going to study the Sermon on the Mount over the next few weeks and maybe a month, I don't know how long it's going to take, but this is going to be powerful study because Jesus says this sermon, if you don't hear this sermon and if I don't start off with this sermon, you're not going to understand anything that I do. So he's trying to separate fans from followers. He's saying, I am trying to raise some followers who are going to be devout. Till this time, he's probably observing people and people have probably seen or, or in his journey of, 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 of ministering to people, not till this time, but in his journey of ministering to people, there are people that liked his miracles and people that came because of his meals. These were the two reasons as to why people congregated. They wanted to see Jesus. They wanted to see the miracles, the signs, the wonders, the stuff that people were talking about, the Messiah that was to come. And they heard this good food. Wherever Jesus is, there's good food. All right, he multiplies food. All right, fish magically appears out of nowhere. Bread appears out of nowhere. Wine appears out of nowhere. And who doesn't like some good wine? So they were like, let's go. Jesus, bring some good stuff. That's all they knew, Jesus. Jesus is like, no, no, no. I need to separate the followers, the, the followers that are serious about this from the fans that are just in it for the show. Like he's stressing the importance of discipleship. He's talking to the disciples. He says, you come, you sit down. I want to talk to the ones that are serious. The chapter started off with Jesus narrowing in on discipleship. Now we call Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the first four, the first four books of the New Testament, synoptic gospels, a synop which means there are a lot of similarities between the stories, the historical books, their accounts of Jesus' walking and talking with people. So these four individuals are presenting the case of Jesus in four different ways, but in many ways, the story is very similar. So Luke, Dr. Luke, who happens to be a physician by profession, is presenting the story in a different way. He's introducing us, and I want you to go to Luke 14. This is important because if we don't understand the, 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 the gist of this, the whole message won't make sense. So I'm going to take a little bit from the account of Matthew, and I'm going to take a little bit from the account of Luke. The, the title of that passage is The Cost of Being a Disciple. The Cost of Being a Disciple. Jesus is essentially sitting his disciples down and saying, y'all, I have brought you here and I'm about to talk to you because this is just not an exclusive club that we're about to do. There is a cost associated with this membership. It's not a, some money that you have to pay. It's not dues that you have to pay. It's not yearly or monthly. No, 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 this is bigger than that. There are sacrifices that have to be made. Verse 25, Luke 14, 25. Large crowds were traveling with Jesus and turning to them, he said, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even their own life, such a person cannot be my disciple. Whoa, Jesus. I thought we had to be more welcoming than that, Jesus. I thought we had to, you know, just make sure that we smile at everybody. We give them the best. We're trying to, we're trying to build a crowd here, Jesus. We're trying to build a religion here, Jesus. Like Christianity, Jesus. Like we need to offer them coffee and donuts in the lobby, Jesus. We need to smile at them and tell them to come back, Jesus. We shouldn't scare them away. Pastor, we need to tone this down a little bit, Pastor. Your, your, your messages are pretty harsh. We, 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 if you need people to congregate, if you need people to be added, if you need people to follow you. No, 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 but Jesus has a different philosophy. He's like, the way I distinguish fans from followers is if I just give them a boot camp, all right? I'm going to scare the living, all right, earth out of them. 
I'm scared out of them. You ready for this? He, said, he, he turns around. He sees this huge ocean of people falling. He stops. He looks and says, you ready to lose your mom? You ready to lose your dad? You want to follow me? You ready to die? You're like, whoa, Jesus. Like, calm down. Like, like his disciples are like, Jesus, well, we, we worked really hard for this conference and this crusade to happen. We have done a lot of publicity. We've done a lot of marketing. We have done so much. We have gone out. We've done some outreach. We have told people that this Jesus is loving and kind and welcoming and, and his heart is so big and you're trying to scare them away, Jesus. And he looks at them and says, if anyone comes to me and does not hate their father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, even their own life, such a person cannot be my disciple. Wow. A group of people just heard that and just walked away, maybe. That's not seeker friendly, Jesus. That's not, that's not what the disciples told us in the marketplace that the message that you had was, right? And, and he goes on, and whoever does not carry their cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. Wait, wait, even before the cross was there that Jesus climbed on, he said, you have to follow me. You have to carry your own cross. And, and hearing that, I'm sure a bunch of other people were like, ah, I'm not a thief. I'm not a robber. Cross doesn't belong to me. Verse 28, suppose one of you wants to build a tower. Wait, hold on. Jesus Jesus goes, like, he started with, hey, if you want to follow me, you got to leave your brother and sister, and this is like a family thing that he was bringing on, and suddenly he's like, suppose, verse 28, suppose one of you want to build a tower. Wait, hold on, Jesus, like, you're going on a different tangent right now. Like, Jesus goes full-on fixer-upper on them. He goes full-on flipper-flop, ugliest house in America, property brothers on them, and he's talking about building. You ready for this? He says, suppose one of you wants to build a tower. Won't you first sit down and estimate the cost to see if you have enough money to complete it? For if you lay the foundation, are not able to finish it, everyone who sees it will ridicule you, saying, this person began to build and wasn't able to finish. Verse 31. Or suppose a king is about to go war against another king. Oh, whoa, Jesus. You went on one tangent and now you're about to go on a, you were property brothers like two minutes ago. Now you're switching channels real quick. We're going history channel. He's going full on Vikings, seal team mode right now. Or suppose a king is about to go to war against another king. Won't he first sit down and consider whether he's able, he is able with 10,000 men to oppose the one coming against him with 20,000? If he is not able, he will send a delegation while the other is still a long way off and will ask for terms of peace, will ask for a truce. Verse 33, in the same way, those of you who do not give up everything you have cannot be my disciples. I don't have time to get into all of this, but verse 34, salt is good. Wait, what? Like, hold on, Jesus. You got to make up your mind. Like, this is not a good sermon right now because a good sermon is structured. A good sermon is you stick on point one and point two connects with the second point. But you started off with fixer upper. You went on to the Vikings and now you're going full on food network on me. Jesus goes top chef, tournament of champions, Guy Fieri diners, drive-ins and, 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 and dives, whatever that is. Bobby Flay on them and he says, salt is good. Ah, oh, Jesus, you lost me. But if it loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? For it is fit neither for the soil. Here we go again, Jesus. Here we go again. You switched to Food Network. Now we're going to a gardening show. All right. Jesus goes Miracle Grow, Home Depot, Callaways, Yard Crashers, God and Rescue on us. And he says, it is fit neither for the soil nor for the manure pile. It is, thro it, it is thrown out. Whoever has ears to hear, let him hear. Y'all like the miracles? Y'all like the meals? But trust me, that's not what the kingdom of God is about. That's not what I'm about to preach to you about. I'm about to tell you how the Christian has to be salty and lit. I'm going to tell you how important salt is and how important it is for you to be the salt. Discipleship is important. 
For the Christian, the believer that, that thinks and says, you know what, I can come attend on a Sunday morning and I can go and that's my quota of God for the week. Trust me when I tell you this, you are flawed in your understanding. That's not what the Christian life is. If you are not submitted to discipleship during the week, if you don't have a systematic approach to studying the word, praying, fasting and prayer, seeking the face of God, being in community with other believers, being accountable with other people holding you accountable, being open to correction, I can go on and on and on. You have no discipleship whatsoever. You're a Sunday Christian, you're a Sunday believer at the most, but Jesus is stressing on discipleship. It's never a gray area with Jesus. It's never a, you know, it's never a this or that. It's never a bait and switch. It's never a, come on, everybody's welcome. We're a church for everybody. Everybody come as you are. And then after they come in, let me switch it up on them and let me show them. No, no, no. He's like, from the word go, while you're walking, I don't even want y'all to sit. While you're walking, let me tell you what the kingdom of God is about. It's about sacrifices. It's about discipleship. It's about showing up to life groups. It's about showing up to, to, to Taco Tuesday. Come on. Not but it's too far, Jesus. Really? Is it? Hold on. I'm coming there in just a second. But, but my kids have to go to school the next day, Jesus. Really? It's about coming to midweek services. I'm stepping on some toes today. Can I preach? Have you all tuned out as yet? It's not a, hey, let me make you a member first and then I'm going to switch it up on you. It's like, are you ready to die today? If you take another step, you're saying okay to dying. Are you okay with that? Are you willing to abandon everybody and everything you know to follow me today? And the answer has to be a yes and an it, it can be a, let me pray about it and let me come back. Let me go think about it. Let me talk to my mentors. Let me talk to my pastor. It's not an issue you pray about. When Jesus says, I want your whole heart, it's a whole allegiance. It's everything you have. It's, an, it's a life of abandon. It's a, I may not be first, but I know that Jesus is with me. It costs something and he's constantly vetting people. And in this process, he looks and he says, man, you're called to be the salt of the earth. Salt. Salt was a huge deal. At least in that context, salt is a huge deal. Today, if, if we can look at what Jesus is trying to teach his disciples using your Morton salt, you know, uh, thing in your head. You're like, oh, okay, Morton salt. How much does Morton salt cost? 79 cents at the store. I don't know how much it costs, but it costs nothing. Almost anybody can afford salt. But back in Jesus' time, salt was one of the most expensive things. So you see how the gospel writers didn't switch it up and the new versions just didn't switch it up and said diamonds. No, no, no. They wanted to say salt. Because here's a journey that Jesus wants to take us into, into understanding the value of what we're about to talk about. Sal or, or salt, the word salt, it comes from the Latin word sal, where, where you get the word salarium, which is the word, the, the word salary in English comes from. It was valuable. Salt was so valuable that, that people would actually store it in their house. They would say that there was a storehouse in the house. There was a room for salt in the house. If you invited somebody for dinner at the house, there's only people that they, the, the, the master of the house trusted so much that they would allow to sit closest to the door of the, the, the room that had the salt in it. That's how valuable salt was. They would trade using salt. That was their salary in Roman, in, in Roman for, for the Roman soldiers. They paid them in salt. It was that expensive. It was treasured. Like each of us, our body contains a, a, a certain level of sodium or salt, which aids in giving life by retaining water in our bodies and assisting our hearts to pump everything and, 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 and pump it out and, and, and our hearts to function the way it should and, and, and make sure that everything else functions equally good. Like, have you ever had some food without salt? We just finished Thanksgiving. Anybody? You, you just take a bite into the food and you're like, mmm, 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 mmm. And how many of y'all have ever said, pass me the salt? Or in many of your cases, it's like, pass me the Sri Raja. <laughs> some spicy sauce. 
And we've always, we all have been there at some point in time. Like food needs to have salt on it. Like, you know, like McDonald's fries kind of salt. Like when you bite into it, you need to feel your teeth biting on the, come on, am I talking to somebody? Like fries without salt is not what? No, it's not. It's like Chick-fil-A. You know what I'm saying? Like, like Chick-fil-A. They have their chicken so good. They have it down. But I'm like, y'all need to get your fries right. Like, don't give me the packet of salt on the side. You dump the salt before giving it to me. Come on. Some of y'all need to email Chick-fil-A about this issue, okay? We need to get get the fries right. It needs to have salt. There are three uses that I'm going to be talking about today. There are so many uses in the world for salt, but I'm going to talk about three uses. As the Bible would also remind us, salt, for one, is used for seasoning. Salt is used for seasoning. Someone say seasoning. seasoning. See, salt has this ability to unlock delicious flavor. See, while too much of a good thing can be a bad thing, the right amount of salt can create unforgettable dishes. Am I talking to somebody? Like, like I love to cook. Anything I cook, I have a good grasp of how much salt needs to go in the food. But there's one dish that I cook that I always mess up on the salt, okay? It's this Indian dish that I cooked called, cook called biryani. I love this dish, okay? Biryani is, is my favorite. I'll eat it for breakfast, lunch, and dinner, seven days a week, 30 days. A- That's why I look the way I look, okay? So I, I can eat it a lot, okay? I love cooking biryani. But the thing is, the way I cook biryani When I cook this dish, which is made up of rice and a particular meat, and sometimes it's goat or sometimes it's chicken, the way I cook it, I have to seal the dish when I have to allow it to cook and steam. And after I seal the dish, I have no idea how much of salt is in this dish. It's crazy because I can get everything else right. I can get the meat to the right tenderness. I can get the rice to the right texture. I can get all the other flavors and all the other spices to the right amount. But if I go bad, if I go less, or if I go more on the salt, I have absolutely no control of how that dish comes out. And there are times that I've had to throw an entire pot of biryani out because I messed up on the salt. Because I messed up on the salt. Because you underestimate it because you can't cook it like other dishes where you keep cooking and you taste it and you're like, ah, more salt. Cook. Most, I do it every other way. But this one, I have to seal it and I have to say, I can't see it for a while. So it, it's, it's difficult. And, and, and salt has this ability to either make a dish good or it has an ability to completely destroy a dish. And as salts of the earth, we are agents of flavoring. Our purpose on earth, and I'm going to give you the most obvious statements here. Our purpose is to bring the tastes of heaven to earth wherever we go. Salt improves flavors. It seasons. There are a few men over here in our church that has been to a steakhouse here in Dallas that has opened up not too long ago. And the guy that owns the steakhouse is fondly referred to as Salt Bay. And he is known for picking up salt and he, he, he'll put a steak in front of you and you come to your table if you order, uh, I don't know how much, of, let's, let's not go into that, how many dollars worth of uh, steak you order. He will personally come up to your table and he will pick up salt, coarse salt, and then he will, this, this is his action, he'll put it down along his sweaty arms, the salt will come down and it will fall. <laughs> so not only is the salt flavoring your food, the body salts are also flavoring your food. Andrew was sick for a week after eating that. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. (laughs) The right amount of food. You know, in low concentrations, salt suppresses bitterness and enhances sweetness. In, In higher concentrations, salt reduces sweetness but enhances the umami, the savory flavors. And just as salt brings the best in food, so Christ brings out the best in us and others experience the flavor of Christ in and through our lives. Just the right amount of salt is enough for you to make a change in the world around you. 
For some of us, we go in with a lot of salt. We just want to just go at it. You don't know Jesus? Let me show you Jesus. All right, we're just preaching brimstone and fire on them, and we're telling them to be saved and baptized the first day that they heard about Jesus. Come on, somebody. You've been there? You pull like so much of salt, and they're like, ow. Ever been there where you had food with too much salt, and some of us can be too salty? Someone say, too salty. Go in front of them with those banners. You are a sinner. Repent. Come back. And they're like, I don't see Jesus in that banner. Come on, am I talking to somebody? Some of you are like, Pastor, come on, man. I thought you were, you were with us. I thought you were pro, you know, preaching the gospel and the king. I am. But, but, but we're the salt of the earth, and we need to know that unless and until we have a control of this salt, it's going to be of no use to this earth that we were put in. Some of us are so stingy with the salt. We're like, damn. We take a pinch of salt pretty serious. We're like, I'll do as much as I need to do, and that's it. I'm done for my quarter for the year. I have served one outreach in the year, and I'm good, pastor. You remember I came? I did. I showed up. Some of y'all don't like me today. It's okay. Don't underdo it because we're, we're here's, here's the thing, unless and until we understand that we are called, and I don't want to spend too much time on this because I have more to cover, but here's the thing. You got to be, someone say, be salty. The second thing that salt is used for is preserving. Someone say preserving. You know, Jesus awakens each of us to this, this purpose that we have inside of us, not just to flavor the world around us, but to preserve the world around us. You know, curing practices started in Egypt way, way, way back and it spread all through Israel and even the place where Jesus delivered this Sermon on the Mount, the place that he's standing and teaching from overlooks the Sea of Galilee and this town called Magdala, which was famous for curing fish. The fishermen would go and buy the fish and they would come and in order to store them, they had a center there in Magdala that would actually brine the fish, that would actually store the fish and they would make sure that it's salted enough to make sure that it is preserved for a very long time. Like everyone knew that salt's primary role, as Jesus was saying, be the salt of the earth, was to be the role of a preserver. They didn't have a refrigerator back then. So to preserve their food, they used salt, especially when mercury was on the rise, like the prices, they, they needed salt. In essence, what Jesus is telling his disciples and us today is we are agents of preserving. God has called us and placed us in a culture in this time, in this moment, in this slice of history to preserve the ways, the teachings, the life, the power, and the presence of Jesus Christ. Like in what way are we as Christians making sure that we are preserving the message of Jesus Christ? How can I preserve? What are you talking about? It's talking about standing up for what you believe in, standing up for gospel values. To begin with, it's about voting your values. We're all just done with election season. It's so important that what does God stand for? The things that I stand for, the social justice issues that I stand for, does Jesus stand for those same things? Does Jesus value those same things? It's important. Are you preserving the culture of the kingdom of God? We're put in a culture where they just, we, we, as a culture, we just want to adapt and adopt anything that looks cool and that sounds awesome, that sounds pretty rad. And, and God is looking at us and saying, no, 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 I'm the same unchanging God yesterday, today, and forevermore. And I need some believers. I need some Christians. I need some salty people that can actually say, I will do everything in my power to preserve. Come on, am I talking to somebody? Can't Jesus do it on his own? No, 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 no. He needs agents. He needs you. He needs me. And that's why he says, you and I are the salt of the earth. He didn't say, I am the salt of the earth. No, no, no. He said, you. Can't Jesus just do it with a snap of his finger? I'm sure he can. But he says, you, I have a task. I have a duty. I have a responsibility in preserving that which God has created. That's exactly why God created man. He said, hey, I'm creating these animals. You don't create them. I create them, but you preserve them. 
You take care of them. From the beginning, God created man as caretakers. It is so important that man takes care of the culture of the kingdom of God. You preserve cultures. We preserve the value of human life. We preserve the value of traditional family. We preserve the value of what marriage is, what the Bible tells us it is. We value religious freedom. I can go on and on and on, but just the right amount. See, for the flavoring, you just have to sprinkle. But here's the thing for, 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 the, for the preserving. It's a lot more than a sprinkle. Am I talking to somebody? You just can't do one post, a one share. Can't do it, brother. I just shared it with two people. No, no, no. You got, you got to go over and above. You, you got to make sure that the, the preserving doesn't happen with sprinkling. It has to be caked on the meat. It has to be caked on. Come on, am I talking to somebody? That, that fish needs to be caked in salt. That meat needs to be caked in salt in order for that particular meat to be preserved. It takes a lot more. It takes a pouring of salt. It takes a, a good amount, a, a very generous amount of salt. Because you know what salt does? Salt, salt, and, and like I said, just the right amount because over or under can, can be very, 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 proved to be very bad. Why? Because salt has this ability to suck out the moisture from anything it touches. Yes, as the salt of the earth, we're, we're, we are an important preserving agent and a vital flavoring agent, but we're also something more. Sometimes God uses some excessive salt to kill some stuff in our life. Like, do you know snails and slugs can be killed with salt? I was listening to, to, to Tim Ross the other day, and he was talking about how, how snails and slugs can be killed with, if you just dump a bunch of salt on it. Like all its sliminess, all its, the, and, and it's essentially not the salt killing, it's, it's essentially the salt drawing all the moisture out of the snail and out of the slug to which within minutes a snail and a slug will, will, will be killed. They'll die. You know, in Genesis, God rains down sulfur on Sodom and Gomorrah and, and company for debauchery and neglect of the poor. Lot's wife, right? She's turning around, making a conscious effort to look back even when God told her. Not, and God says, run, and, and, and they're running, but she wants to just get a glimpse of the startling sight, and that transforms her into a block of sodium chloride. You remember that? Death. For some of us, we got to dump some salt to kill the pride in our life. Sometimes God is asking us to dump that salt in us to kill that lust in our life. There are things that need killing inside of us. And although God is looking at us and saying, you have to be the salt off the earth, there are some times that we have to dump salt on ourselves. That we got to be salty on ourselves and say, there are things in our life that need to be killed that doesn't make me look like Jesus. In verse number 13, the Bible says, you are the salt of the earth, but if salt has lost its state, how shall it, how shall its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's foot. You know what some commentators will say? Some commentators will say that it's impossible for salt to lose its taste. Because that's what the Bible is saying. Obviously, those people that say that have never worked in a salt mine. Salt can and does lose its saltiness through the influx of other substances. When other substances invade an area in which salt is, when you allow foreign substances to invade and toxic substances, I'm going to repeat this. Every word I say is important. Toxic substances, toxic chemicals, toxic gases to invade a space in which salt is present, salt loses its potency. So, so Jesus isn't kidding here when he says salt can lose its saltiness. See, when salt is overpowered, it loses its ability to perform as God designed it to perform. It loses its ability as an influencer. Somebody say influencer. You and I are called to be influencers in the world that we're in. 
We're called to be salty. We're called to be lit. We're called to be people that go into the presence of God, go into this world that God has put us in and be the hands and feet of Jesus. And if there's something that is stopping us from doing that, it's external influences that is taking the saltiness out of what God created us to be. What are toxic things in your life that are taking you away from that? What are you allowing your eyes to be exposed to? What are you allowing your thoughts to be exposed to? What are we allowing our hearts to be exposed to constantly day after day that doesn't allow us to be fruitful? That doesn't allow us to be effective as we should be? We're the salt of the earth. We're an agent of preserving. We're an agent of flavoring. And the physician Luke adds yet another dimension of our salty purpose. We discover this as, as he frames Jesus' teachings, right, in slightly different terms. He's saying, man, if, if salt is good, but if it loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is fit neither for the soil nor for the manure pile. It is thrown out. Whoever has ears, let him hear. Here's a new twist. Here's a new twist. I talked about it before. Manure. Home Depot. Callaway's kind of stuff here. Smelly stuff. Dirty stuff. Gardeners, if you ask gardeners, organic gardeners, they'll wince at the idea of applying salt to soil. Because here's what salt, large amounts of soil has the ability to impoverish land, impoverish soil. It has the ability, but the proper amount of soil will, salt will actually cause plants to flourish. And that is why both sodium and the salt substitute potassium chloride appears on the list of ingredients of miracle Grow. For those of you all who don't know what miracle Grow is, it's a soil that has been cultivated specifically for the purposes of, 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 of growing plants and vegetables. And you'll find it in different ways and different methods. And there is this one substitute, salt substitute, called potassium chloride in there. It's not only humans who require salt to live. Plants and salt need it too. And that brings me to the third point. It's fertilizing. Salt is used for fertilizing. And Luke, in this passage, suggests that salt plays a role in manure too. Here's what that potassium chloride will do. It will break down the fresh excrement for better plant absorption. The manure that is present, as soon as it comes out, what, what happens is this chemical, potassium chloride, will go in and it will break it down in order for the soil to receive it better. The mineral prevents dung hills from rotting and becoming useless and providing nutrients to the soil. I need you to catch on to this. Luke is clarifying that Jesus warns us about losing our sal saltiness. He's not talking about table salt. He is not talking about Morton salt. He's not talking about kosher salt or sea salt. No, no, no. He's not talking about any of that. He's describing fertilizer salt. Yes, as the salt of the earth, we are agents of human flourishing. We are ought to go into every arena, every ground, every place that God sends us to. And we are ought to break down the schemes of the enemy. We are going to the worldly schemes and things. And we're going to say, Lord, we are going to make the change. We are going to make this soil what it's supposed to be. We are the salt poured on that which is foul in order to foster fresh and new life. That which is foul, that which is smelly, that which is coming straight, that which is called dung. I'm sorry for my crass use of word. That which is called dung can be changed into something that is beautiful, that will allow growth to happen when salt is introduced into the mix. Don't sit back and tell me, oh, it's, the world is far gone. God has given us the ability to take the things of the world, to take the darkness of the world. And I'm encouraging somebody today. Sometimes the places God sends us to will feel like manure-like places. The last places you want to go to, the last situation you'd ever want to engage in. But like Jonah, you may be tempted to resist the hardship, the discomfort, the awkwardness, the stinkiness, to stay in your comfort zone. Yet, it's your salty fertilizer that brings salvation to a dysfunctional and dying world. You know where, where, where salarium, the word sal salary comes from? The word sal, salt. You know what else? Another word that comes out of that? Salvation. <laughs> comes from the same root. And God is calling some people. Be salty. 
Fulfill your purpose. Go into the world and be fertilizers to the dead world, to the world that is decaying, the world that is dying, the world that's about to perish. Go in and be the salt of the world so that they will come to the saving grace of Jesus Christ. Somebody say amen. I want to conclude. And then he says, you are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket or on a stand. It gives light to all in the house in the same way. Let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Someone say, stay lit. It's important. Don't just be salty. Stay lit. That's what the Bible says. It doesn't say you ought to be the light. It says you are the light. Like that's how you were made. That's what the Christian is, is what the Bible is teaching us. Light is meant to fill a dark room. Light finds its purpose when it shines, shines away from itself, not to itself. I want us, I want us to listen to this because I'm, I'm slowly closing this message. Is there, are you the light in your world? Are you the light in your job? Are you the light in your school? The Bible says it's like a city on a hill. It's referring to Israel. Supposed to be a set apart group of people, a, a country, a, a, a people that was set apart like a city on a hill that people cannot ignore, that people cannot not see. That's who Israel was. They were distinctive. And God looks at you and me and says, you are supposed to be set apart. That people need to notice you. You're not supposed to be coward. You, you can't be a coward for the Lord. Like people ought to see, see you in the workplace as soon as, not because you're all flashy, not because you're wearing the most expensive clothes, not because of all of that. People ought to notice you because Jesus is in you and you are shining the light of Jesus. You're a city on a hill. It says light a lamp and put it, some of us are lighting lamps and putting it under the baskets. He says he doesn't give light to the house if that happens. He says let your light shine before others. That what? That people might see your good works shine light outside of yourself. Church, the church doesn't exist for itself. There is a tendency that we have. We have this tendency that we're leaning towards where we just want to be inclusive. As long as we can meet, as long as we can worship, as long as we can get, get together and have a Friendsgiving once a year, as long as we can have a Christmas program, as long as we can do these things, we're good. But that's not what God is calling us to do. We cannot shine light where light already exists. A lot of Christians are trying to shine light on each other. And God's like, man, no, no, that's not what I'm asking. No, 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 pastor, I'm trying, to, I'm trying to take out the, like, expose the darkness in them. No, 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 that's not your ministry. That's not what God has called. I'm holding them accountable, pastor. No, 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 no. Just pastors are there for that sometimes. Okay? Sometimes you have to go and shine your light to the most obvious places, the dark places. Am I talking to somebody? Like, you know who takes lights and, sh like, like, I only see it in scary movies where you take the flashlight and you shine in your, in your face. Like, why do, like, like, scary movies, they always run out of the battery and, like, like, like flashlights. Have you noticed that? <laughs> like, it's, it's always the case. I don't know why, but we are tangent, but I, I didn't mean to go there, but come, coming back. I only see that, like, you shine the, the light in your face. Like, like, that's not normal. Like, it's not supposed to be lit in your face. If you're the light and my question is this, why are you not displaying it? If we are supposed to be the light of the world, it's like the sun and the moon. We have two sources of light, the sun and the moon. And the sun shines in itself. And the moon is a reflection of the sun. We are the moon ought to shine and reflect the light that Jesus shines on our life so that the whole world will see Jesus in and through me, in and through me and you. Then why? Why are we not allowing the light to shine? Because it's there. And the, the Bible says, you put a basket over it. What's your basket? What's your basket? Your basket's probably because you love the spotlight. Because I want it all to be on me. As long as my ministry grows, as long as my life is good, my family's okay, I'm good. I don't care about the world that's, lose, that, that's lost. I don't care about the world that's dying. None of that. The second one is fear. Some of our baskets is fear. 
You're like, sh- like, like covering the light because you're afraid. Afraid of what? I don't know. Afraid of the, you know, man rejecting you? Like, I'm just imagining a conversation with Paul or like any of the disciples or apostles back in the day. Right? Jeff, like, if Peter came up to you and has this conversation with you, I'm like, hey, Jeff, man, like, like, why are you not sharing the gospel with your friends? Like, Joe, and like, why are you not sharing Jesus with your coworkers? Like, Paul is coming up to you, Stephen, and having an authentic conversation. Like, I just want to know why. And you're not saying anything. You're like, oh, I don't know, Paul. And Paul's like, I, I really want to know. Is it because, like, you'll be killed? No, not really. Is it because you'll be dragged through the streets? No. What are you talking about, Paul? That never happens. Is it because your family will reject you? No, no, no. My family's cool. Is, oh, wait, wait, wait. I get it. I get it. I get it. Is it because, is it because people around you, right, will judge you? Maybe. Maybe. Then what is it? What, what is it, Ashish? Because it's awkward. Like, think about that for a second. You know the number one reason as to why people put baskets on their lights? Because it's awkward to shine this light. I don't, know, I don't know how to have that conversation, Pastor Ashish. I don't know what that conversation will end up like, Pastor Ashish. I don't know if I'm opening up. Like, I don't, I don't know what to say next, Pastor Ashish. Like, it's an awkward conversation to have. Do you know Jesus? No, no. I, like, it's a, it's a very awkward conversation to have. And, and God is looking at some of us and saying, hey, man, like, try telling that to Paul. Like, are you afraid that you'll be beheaded? Because that's what happened to them. And yet, they were willing to put their lives on the line just to make sure that their light, because they wanted to be a city on the hill. They wanted Jesus to be known and preached about. Worship team, you guys can get ready to come up. And he says, man, I've called you to be the salt of the world. Stay lit. Stay, stay salty. Oof. But some of us are afraid. We're fearful. Do I have what it takes, Pastor? Like, this is a pretty big task. There's a lot of people to save, Pastor. There are a lot of people that don't know Jesus, Pastor. See, so many of us are intimidated by the harvest where God is looking at each one of us and saying, I don't require every one of you to make sure, or each one of you, or even one of y'all to make sure that, ev- like I'm not asking a Billy Graham out of you, is what Jesus is reminding us today. But let me tell you this. A little bit goes a far way. A little bit goes a far way. For me, you know, it's hard to know where to begin some days, and I'm pretty sure it's you too. Sometimes I become overwhelmed by the sheer amount of texts or calls or messages or emails I get about questions about Jesus, questions about, you know, people wanting to meet with me, to ask me about their walk of faith. I do. But sometimes when I hurt myself and when I harm myself and I... And I, and I go hard on myself because I don't do much or I don't do enough. I remind myself of this, this little piece that I read not too long ago. And I want to remind some of you all about this today. It's this word of wisdom that's stuck into some of these ancient Jewish writings known as the Talmud. And I want you to listen very carefully. Somewhere in there it says this line, it says, if someone is suffering and in need, and you can take away one sixtieth of their pain, then that is goodness. Leave the rest up to others and to God. That's pretty powerful, y'all. Like, this is a powerful expression and us being the salt, like preservers, flavorers, fertilizers of the earth, that fraction, one sixtieth, that's loaded with wisdom. 
Like one, this liberates us from pressure thinking that everything depends upon me. Like my workplace is not going to come to know Jesus if I don't share the gospel, if I don't preach to them from Romans, or if I don't do a Bible study in the morning, or if I don't pray for them, or I don't have join hands together. In the, no, 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 that's not what I'm getting at. What is your 160th? What is your 160th? Your little one grain of salt can help with something someone else's grain cannot. And when all these grains get mixed and sprinkled together, preserving and flavoring and helping others flourish, it starts occurring everywhere. None of us are meant to preserve the whole world. That's not what, but the 160th. The 160th. Like today, I want to challenge you. You can begin today by simply asking God to bring to mind someone for whom you can ease one sixtieth of their pain. One sixtieth of their pain. And don't be surprised if this person is closer than you think. This person might be the person sitting next to you right now in church. This person might be somebody that you haven't reached out to in a few years. Would you stand up to your feet with me? But pastor, what do I need to do, pastor? Give me two things. Give me five things. Give me three things. I'll, let me give you two, Let me give you a few things. You, you, let me tell you what not to do. You, you ready? Let me tell you what not to do so you can be salty and lit. Ready? Point number one. Stop salting other salt. Stop salting other salt. We're so good at this. We're so good at salting. What do you mean, Pastor Ashish? See, in order for salt to work, it can't stay in the salt shaker. The purpose of salt isn't to salt other salt. Unless and until you sprinkle, unless and until you move, unless and until you get out of your comfort zone, you're not going to be able to be of use to the world outside. You will be salt. You will never be salt of the world. Like your salt needs desperate seasoning. Your salt needs, sorry, your world needs desperate seasoning. Your world needs desperate preserving. Your world needs desperate fertilizing. But some of us are just salting other salt. We're encouraging other brothers in church, other sisters in church. We're just doing our life groups and that's good. I'm not dogging on you. If you signed up for a life group, that's great. If you're a part of a community, that's great. But some of us are content with salting other salt. Let me salt Jerry a little bit. Let me salt Ashley a little bit. As long as you do that, we're good. And, and God's like, thank you. But salt don't need salt. Am I, am I talking to somebody? <laughs> what, th th then what do we do? Because here's what, here's what salting on the salt can do. You can start clumping. Am I talking, like... Salt can start clumping. So the second thing you do is stop clumping. There's this scientific process called hygroscopy, which means that salt absorbs water vapor from surrounding air and makes salt clump together. When moisture gets into salt, I, I talked about this earlier, when you allow toxic stuff to get in, the salt starts becoming clumps of salt. That no matter how much you shake, it's not coming out because all it's doing is it's beating around the salt shaker. Am I talking to somebody? But so many of us have allowed that to happen. We have allowed that to happen when we stay in the shaker long enough. Have you ever had that salt shaker that you just forgot about? It was somewhere in the pantry and then somebody asked for it and you're like, oh, I got it somewhere here. And then you bring it out and it's like a blob of salt, like a rock of salt. You're like, is this how it came? No, 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 no. It just sat there and moisture got built up. Am I talking to somebody? Hmm. For some of us, we put it in the fridge. Worst place. It's frozen cold. Moisture's gotten in. Come on. Some of you are preserving salt. Like you're preserving yourself. I don't know what you're preserving yourself for. For the second coming of Jesus. No, no, no. That's not what we're... Pre don't preserve yourself. Spend yourself. Stop clumping. What, what, what do you mean, Pastor Ashish? Like without your knowledge, we start clumping. Like we talk to the same people in church. 
We step on some toes. We go to lunch with the same people after service. We sit in the same place at church. We give the same amount of money to God every month, every week. We serve once every six months so pastor won't be on our case. I know if I don't show up to church three times in a row, pastor will text me. So as long as I can show up the third time, I'm good. We're hanging on to other salt. As long as I know other salt, I'm good. As long as I can talk to other salt, I'm good. But the moment somebody that doesn't look like me comes, I have no idea how to approach them. I have no, like, get out of your shaker. Am I talking to somebody? Like, do things that you've never done before. This is, this is transformational and, and you're hanging on to it. And that's why we're not coming out. That's why you're not being effective. And I'm asking you today, can you challenge yourself to stop clumping? Someone say, stop clumping. And the last thing is this. Man, I preached for too long today. The last thing is this. Can I leave you with this? Stop using your salt for the wrong reasons. Some of us love bringing out the salt shaker when people are hurt. That's when our saltiness kicks in. We real salty. That's not the salty that Jesus is talking about. You're wounded? Let me bring a salt. Let me add salt to your wound, Robert. Let me make you more miserable than you are. Let me make you feel more, more of a sinner than you already are. Let me go and tell five people about what you did. Let me tell the pastor. Let me tell his wife. Let me tell my friends and their friends and their mother-in-law about what you did. Let me just add salt because that's what I do. I just, I just want to bless. No, no, no. That's not blessing. Stop using your salt in the wrong way. Your salt should edify. Your salt should build. Your salt should flavor. Your salt should preserve. Your salt should not tear down. Your salt should not make someone cry. Your salt should not make someone leave the church. Your salt should not make someone leave God and abandon the faith. Your salt should be the light of the world. Your salt should encourage. Your salt should build. That's what salty and that's what being lit should be. It should be encouraging and lifting. Thank you for listening. We love bringing you the word on so many different platforms. We are so thankful for what God is doing in and through us. We'd love for you to subscribe so you don't miss out. And don't forget to share this message if it has blessed you.